be like a contagious disease, Father. Your presence right now in Jesus' name. Blessed are the ones who do not bury all the broken pieces of their heart. Blessed are the tears of all the weary, pouring like a sky of falling stars. Blessed are the wounded ones in morning brave enough to show the Lord their scars blessed are the hurts that are not hidden open to the healing touch of God the kingdom is yours the kingdom Welcoming the last, the lost, the least 
church we're so glad that you tuned in with us today for online worship this has been a difficult week for a lot of people we're in week 14 i believe of the pandemic and this has also been a difficult week as um, we've uh, seen uh, the fruits of the injustice in our country and the tension um, that we are dealing with now and the protests and the riots and all that's going on but what all of this has shown is that we need justice we need a God. We need something that anchors uh, justice, but we also need mercy. We also need love. Um, and we're reminded by the words in Exodus 34 that God is both abounding in steadfast love, forgiving sin on the one hand, but at the same time, he will by no means acquit the guilty. Um, and and we, we gather today to worship a God who is both fully just and who is fully loving. Uh, and we, we find comfort in that. Um, but we also want to, to gather for worship to have our character be conformed to God's own character. So as you participate in this liturgy, participate in the singing, participate in the prayers and the confessions, the liturgy is shaping you to be a particular type of person, a person who is like God insofar as they, they love justice, they seek to do justice, but also... Um, love mercy and walk humbly with God. So let us stand um, and be called to worship of the God who is both just and merciful. 
Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for he is glorious. The Lord has chosen us as his people, those for his own inheritance. The Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. In heaven and on earth, the Lord does as he pleases. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Let us sing to this King of all kings.
praise the King of Kings and sing his glory. And as we, we come in contact and encounter a God who is utterly holy, we're reminded um, that we're not. We're reminded um, that despite our efforts to seek justice, we're also a part of the problem. Uh, we are also perpetrators ourselves. And so we gather to confess um, our sins, um, knowing that we have a God who is merciful. Um, so let us confess our sins together. O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, who, who keeps, keeps covenant, covenant love and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your wisdom and ways. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us belongs open shame, because we have sinned against you. We have transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. We deserve nothing but your justice. Yet, Lord, we ask for your mercy and favor. We turn from our iniquities and seek insight by your truth. O oh God, listen to the prayer of your people and to our pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O oh Lord, make your face to shine upon us. O oh God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desperation for you. O oh God, we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pour out your Spirit upon us and align us to your ways. Delay not for your own sake, O oh God, for we are your people, called by the name of your Son. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Hear now this assurance of pardon from Colossians chapter 1. God has made known to you the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ, so that your hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Amen. Let us praise this God who offers us forgiveness in Christ. Worship the whole 
glory consumes like fire And what other power can raise the dead And what other name remains undefeated Only a holy God So come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing only forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Oh, come and behold. me to call him father only a holy God only a holy God come and behold him the one and the only cry out sing oh Worship the Holy God. Oh, come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing only forever, a Holy God. Come and worship the Holy God. awesome God, we give you thanks and praise for your holiness and your justice, and yet at the same time, oh God, for your mercy and your grace. Lord, as that song says, we thank you that we can come before you knowing that in your holiness, in your greatness, Lord, there is no name like your name. There is no one who is high and lifted up and majestic and in awesome splendor and might. And yet at the same time, oh God, we can approach you even in your holiness because of the mercy and the grace that you have shown us in and through your son. And so Father, we know that you have invited us into your presence. You cover over our failings. God, you invite us to call you Father. And so Lord, we worship you, we bow before you today. God, in our hearts, Lord, but with our lives, Lord, we bow before you because of your greatness. Lord, there is none like you, O oh God. Lord, you have demonstrated to us the fullness of the hope that we need in the person and the work of Christ. And so, Lord, it is him that we proclaim today. It is him that we magnify. It is him that we lift up, and it is him, O oh God, that we need. And so, Lord, as we worship you today, oh, Lord, we pray that you would draw us in, draw us ever deeper, God, into, into your heart of compassion for your people. 
and make us more like you. God, even as Paul says, Lord, the more that we behold you, the more clearly that we see you, God, the more like you we become. And so, Lord, that's our prayer today. Help us to see you clearly, O great and mighty King of Kings. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask. Amen. Amen. We are FPC uh, Danvers. And you've heard us say over the years that our mission is that more people would become more like Christ. And that very much is the heart of our mission. But in an effort to help clarify um, and further uh, explore what this means, we've actually um, crafted a new mission statement, which you'll hear more and more about in the coming weeks, particularly as we shift um, from a church campus to uh, our own church plant, to an individual um, church. And here is the mission statement. Uh, We're a community that seeks to make, mobilize, and multiply disciples of Jesus to be faithfully present on the North Shore and around the world for the glory of God. And again, we're going to unpack exactly what that means, but one of the things that we're going to focus in on in the next eight weeks as we explore Daniel is what exactly it means to be faithfully present. How do we be faithful, avoiding on the one hand compromise, avoiding assimilation to the culture, Um, How do we be faithful, but also how do we be present, avoiding isolation and uh, complete irrelevance and um, autonomy from the culture? How do we be faithfully present within the culture? In the words of Jesus, in it, in the world, but not of the world. Um, And we're going to explore that by looking at Daniel over the next eight weeks. Um, And that uh, sermon series is not just a a compartmentalized aspect um, but uh, of our church's identity, but we want it to be at the very core of who we are. Um, So I'm looking forward to exploring Daniel uh, with you all. Um, We are uh, exploring right now various options on how to meet together in person. We realize that uh, being virtual is not ideal, even though if it is necessary uh, given the pandemic. And what we're encouraging our church to do in, in this time, in this intermediate stage, is to begin to meet in small groups. Uh, we believe that the community of, of God is made manifest, particularly in gathering together. And we realize that for some people, this is not a wise decision, whether it's those who are more at the at-risk category or who um, interact with people in the at-risk category. Uh, we would encourage you um, to 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 do as you see best. We don't want to bind your conscience uh, where Scripture does not bind it. But if you are willing and you are interested, we would encourage you to gather in your small groups. You're going to hear more, uh, particularly this week, uh, given Governor Baker's um, new openings and uh, clarifications on the phases, more about what our plan is. So stay tuned for that. Um, If you haven't been tuning into the Sunday School on Identity, we'd encourage you um, to check that out. That's at 9 a.m. right before um, each each week as we stream our, our worship service, uh, as we explore what it means to uh, have our identity in Christ. Um, also, we'd encourage you after church to tune into our post-church fellowship where we, it's a time for Q&A, it's a time to connect with one another and just um, have some fellowship, even if it is virtual fellowship. It's great to connect with one another. We'd also encourage you to check out our midday prayer to come to pray at 12.30 on Zoom um, each week. This week we're going to be focusing on racial justice and praying for the state of our nation, but also the state of the world, um, and how we as a church, but also we as a nation, can seek justice and love mercy and walk humbly. Um, So that is at 12.30 on Tuesday. Also, um, if you've uh, been paying attention to the weekly announcements, you've heard about uh, our Artist Corner. Jenna has put that on in our church, and we've actually got six new paintings here. And we're going to continue to show these slides each week, but what we're also going to do is we're going to start a Facebook page, potentially an Instagram page, where we gather all of these um, paintings that you can look at each one and interact with each one um, more regularly. But we also want it to extend beyond just paintings as well to uh, music and poetry and and other forms of artistic expression, because even as Derek mentioned last week in the sermon, one of the ways God calls us to worship him is through creativity, and one of the best ways to do that is through art. Um, So we'd encourage you to continue to submit um, your artistic works to Jenna. 
and thank you for those who have already. And that is all the announcements I have. Um, so with that, let us go in prayer to God uh, who loves us. Let's pray. Our Father, you are abounding in mercy and compassion, slow to anger, Lord, patient with your people and faithful to us, the faithfulness that our hearts desire. Your love is loyal. Lord, it is greater than we can ever imagine, and it is the source of all joy. You are faithful to us, Lord, even when we stray from your ways. You are holy. Holy, holy, holy. That sound echoes in the halls of eternity uh, from the voices of multitudes singing in heavenly tongues. And we begin to join in prayer with them, praying, Holy, holy, holy are you, O Yahweh. You never compromise on justice, Lord. You are never partial. You do not benefit the rich, Lord but you identify with the poor, the marginalized, the refugee, the weak. You are against the wicked Lord, and you will bring to an end all injustices. But Lord, your holiness makes us aware of our own culpability, not just in what we have done to contribute to systemic and personal injustices, but by what we have left undone. Will you make an end to us, O Lord? We are lying if we say we in and of ourselves do not deserve the same judgment as we call upon, call down upon the wicked, for we ourselves are a part of the problem. But praise be to you, Lord. You never compromise on mercy or justice. You united us to yourself, Lord, and took our shame, our brokenness, our evil. Jesus, you were a victim of injustice. You experienced death, killed by an unjust system, and yet were innocent. And yet, O oh Lord, you did this in order to end all evil without ending us. You did this by taking our evil upon yourself and conquering it, by being conquered. Lord, forgive us for not living in, out of the outflow of who you are. We ask, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would renew our hearts through the gospel that we may live as your son did. Make us like him, O oh God, so that we may do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly, knowing that we can only do this in and through you. We are thankful for your grace, O oh Lord, and we, imp- we pray that you would enable us to be salt and light to a world that desperately needs you. Lord, help our congregation to be a light on the North Shore, a voice, an embodiment of mercy and justice, a combination found only in the gospel. Be with those who are afflicted and victims of systemic and personal injustices. Lord, we ask that you would bring comfort to them and enable them to know and love you. Lord, we pray for revival on the North Shore and around the world. We lament, Lord, that there are billions of people who do not even have access to the gospel. We pray, Lord, that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours. For we know that you delight in revealing yourself, O Lord. Let us seek your kingdom in every aspect of our lives. Lord, we also lift up those who are sick, those who are grieving, those who have lost their jobs or income or are in fear of losing them. In all of these losses, Lord, let us know that we will never lose your love and that you care for us, O Lord. For those who are isolated because of the pandemic, Lord, we pray that you would bring them joy in your word and your spirit. And let us all, Lord, long even more for the day in which we can meet together hopefully soon, but as we also long for the ultimate day where there will be no more mysteries and no more separation from you and from your people. We pray for Grace Chang's mother, Don Lu, as her cancer has returned. We ask that you would heal her, Lord, bring restoration and defeat this cancer. Even in the suffering and sickness, Lord, we know that one day death will be swallowed up once and for all. Be with and over the foster care system, Lord, and help the church participate in that well to your glory. Help us to love those who do not have a stable home, and let us embody hospitality to all. Let us minister out of our weakness, Lord, rather than trying to hide it, knowing that your power is made perfect in our weakness, and that our sufficiency comes from you. Lord, as we begin to study Daniel, help us to live faithfully as resident aliens, as sojourners in a foreign land. Help us not to see this land as our permanent home, for we have no lasting home here but we seek the one that is to come. 
Help those in the workforce and for those who do their labor in the home to work as unto you as they live and minister in the world, Lord. Help us to seek peace, the, the shalom of this city, knowing that every day your kingdom draws near. Lord, may the trumpet sound this very day. May the city of God infiltrate this city once and for all. We pray in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, world without end. Amen. Well, good morning again, church. We are really glad that you have found us virtually. Uh, And like uh, Nathaniel mentioned earlier, I think this is week 14, but it's, again, it's just Groundhog Day, uh, as it has been for a while. Um, And uh, we are so looking forward to being able to to be back together again uh, at some point. But for now, we wait uh, and we pray. Um, And uh, we're, again, just really glad that you have, in faithfulness, you've been tracking with us uh, all these weeks. Mark Watney was 91.6 million miles away from home. And his crew actually had left him for dead. They actually thought he was already dead as they had blasted off back towards Earth. And if you've ever either read the book or seen the movie The Martian, you know the situation that I'm talking about. And as you, as you sit and you think or you watch that movie, it's actually a gripping tale about uh, his longing for home, his desire to get back to earth, but his desperate need for rescue. And yet his immediate problem is that he has to figure out how to survive where he is. Um, He basically only has enough food for a certain number of days, and it's going to take some number of years uh, for people to actually rescue him. And he he has to learn how to grow crops on Mars. This is actually one of the things that he says at one point in talking to his video recorder. He says, I have to make water and learn how to grow food on a planet where nothing grows. And there's this this great scene where after he figures it out, he's again talking to his video uh, as he's recording. And he says, uh, he looks at it and he says, I am the greatest botanist on this planet. And then he realizes I'm actually the only person on this planet. But that movie, that book is actually a metaphor for us as the people of God. It's been a metaphor uh, for us as a people of God ever since I saw it. The, The reality is when you read the scriptures over and over and over again, we're called sojourners, exiles. Think back to, to Abraham, even in the Old Testament, who was set to wander in a place that God had promised to give him, but that was never his while he was still alive. And we are sojourning. We are exiles here. Now, I don't think it probably is news to anybody that we live in a post-Christian context. And I would actually, maybe someday we can argue whether or not America was really Christian in the first place. But that's another conversation for another time. The Bible does describe us as sojourners here. Wherever we are, even on the earth, we as God's people are waiting for our full home. And how do we flourish as disciples of Jesus in a situation, in a circumstance, in a context like this today, right now? Is it even possible? It's like learning how to grow potatoes on Mars. It's very similar to the story of the Martian. We're far from home. We're in desperate need of rescue, but we have to learn how to thrive or flourish? And that's the question that we want to explore over the course of these next eight weeks. Nathaniel already introduced our theme, faithful presence under pressure. And we look at Daniel as we we start unpacking this theme because we need to explore, first of all, what is faithful presence? The pressure we get, we feel it all the time. But what is faithful presence? And how do we survive in a difficult and yet sometimes even harsh or antagonistic climate as God's people? And the contention that I have today, the thing that I want to try to put before us as we look at Daniel chapter 1, is that we can still flourish in exile. It is possible. Faithfulness can still grow right here. But the question is how? In the historical context, and we'll spend more time 
over coming weeks looking into this. But suffice it to say for today that Daniel and his friends that we're going to be introduced to when I read in just a second, they, they were ripped from their homes and their families, probably at the age of 14. And they were forced to march about 1,700 miles from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, they walked. There were no airplanes, no cars. They had their feet, maybe a camel, if their captors were nice. But the bottom line is, they were far from home, and they needed rescue. But while they were there, and we find out today that Daniel was in Babylon for roughly 70 years, they had to figure out how to flourish. They ended up in a city that was the epitome of violence and evil. It was a wicked city. And when you look at the life or the story of Daniel, you actually see that he learns to thrive while he's there. Now, a number of weeks ago when we were doing our series on Psalms, remember the week that we, we looked at Psalm 1, the picture of the tree. Some of our, our pictures, even that we saw from our artists today, were reminded uh, of that, that psalm. It talks about a tree that's flourishing. That's the picture. In Jeremiah 17, which was written around the same time that Daniel was, Jeremiah gives this image, or God through Jeremiah gives this image, about the period of exile. Go read it later today, Jeremiah 17, 1 through 8. When God sends his people into exile, he says that some people are going to be like a dried up shrub, but other people are going to be able to flourish like a tree. It's possible for faithfulness to grow right here. Let's learn from Daniel today. It's a beautifully written story, and so we're going to take the time to read all 21 verses, and Daniel is going to drop some breadcrumbs along the way to help us understand how we might be able to flourish. Look what the scriptures say. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, it's a great kid's name, by the way, if anybody's looking for one, highly recommend that. The king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring out some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate, and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them these names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you, you were in worse condition than the youths uh, who were of your own age? So would you endanger my head with the king? So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over him, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So we listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were in better appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who, the, uh, who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now three things that I want to look at today. Again, just breadcrumbs that I think Daniel teases out for us or just lets out for us that show us how we can still flourish in exile that faithfulness can still grow here. And here's the first thing. This passage teaches us that despite all appearances, we need to remember that God is in control. Maybe you noticed in verse two that the text says, God gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. God gave his own people into the hand of this king. Now on the surface, Babylon had attacked Jerusalem. They laid siege to it. And King Nebuchadnezzar took captives back to Babylon. But Daniel tells us here that the Lord gave. This was the Lord's doing. The word Lord actually used there is, it's not the covenant name of the Lord. It it literally is another word that describes God's rule over all things. It was him that did these things. Now the backstory to all of this, why would God do that? Well, the backstory is actually found in Deuteronomy 28 and even Isaiah chapter 39. Essentially what God had said when he made covenant with his people is he said, you'll stay and you'll dwell in the land as long as you obey what I've commanded you to. So long as you live in faithfulness to me. But if you don't, I'm gonna exile you. I'm gonna scatter you to the nations. Deuteronomy 28 tells us. And in in Isaiah 39, a group of people from Babylon come to to visit King Hezekiah because they actually had heard that he was sick. And when Hezekiah had recovered by the grace of God, Hezekiah showed this envoy from Babylon all of the treasures in the house of God in a boastful way. And God told Hezekiah at that point, because of your arrogance and because of my people's rebellion, they're going to take many of you away. And they're even going to take some of the vessels of the Lord with them. All of the things that you showed them, they're going to go away. That's the backstory. God, though, is still in control here. And that's the thing that Daniel is just trying to tease out for us. God had warned that these things would happen, and now they have. But God is still in control. And did you notice in verse 3, it, we gloss over this, but to a Jew reading this, they would have picked up on two descriptions of the people that were taken away to Babylon. The text says it was the sons of Israel and people from the nobility. Literally, the text says the, the seed of the king. Now, what those two phrases would do, sons of Israel and seed of the king, for a Jew reading this, is they would be reminded of two of God's covenants, the covenant to Abraham and the covenant to David. God had told Abraham that he would be made into a great nation. And one of his sons, it was Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. These people were part of that line. God is still at work. These are the people that God had promised unto Abraham. Daniel is just, again, dropping these little breadcrumbs. God's promise still remains. The sons of Israel, though, have been taken to Babylon. But then this phrase, the seed of the kingdom, that comes from 2 Samuel 7, when God promises David that one of his seed will forever sit upon the throne over his people. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were more than likely direct descendants from David. They too were of the tribe of Judah. And so as these people are marched off to Babylon, by all appearances, it looks like God has been defeated, that God is no longer on his throne. And yet, even in their grief, even when they realize as sons of Israel and as seed of the kingdom, they can still realize and recognize that God's promise remains. So this one verse, just verse 3 alone, it it should cause grief. God's promise to, to Abraham and David seems like it's been defeated, and yet they're still there. They still are alive. And so in some subtle way, it breathes hope. But think about this too. 
Remember when God made a promise to Abraham to give him descendants and offspring? One of the things that he said is, you will be a blessing to the nations. And what we find as we continue reading through the book of Daniel is that Daniel blesses the nations. Even through his exile. Even as he is scattered. Even as the seed is taken to a wicked place, Daniel blesses the nations. And we're going to see that over these coming weeks. So the story on the, on the whole doesn't just show that there would be grief among God's people or a little bit of hope. It also shows a touch of fulfillment. But we have to understand this word about grief here and lament. We're sometimes tempted when we are suffering, when we feel our exile, we're sometimes tempted to just lead into nothing but hopelessness and despair. But I think that happens only when we're not processing these things before God. We talked about that in our psalm series. When you lament, you are crying out to God to close the gap between his promises and your experience. But God's promises remain. You want to be real about how you feel in your experience. And we're going to see Daniel, as we work our way through the rest of the series, we're going to see Daniel do that. He laments. Can we do that? Can we still have hope, knowing that God is still somehow fulfilling his promises, knowing that he's in control, even as we experience exile? Lament expresses the grief and the pain of our circumstance in light of God's promises and the hope that we need to have. It reminds us that God is in control. In the end, it should actually build our faith to lament. But then we get to verses four through seven, an enculturation process. The, the, the Babylonians trying to teach these people their ways, their customs. They teach them their literature, their language, and they give them food. And we'll talk about the food in a minute, but right now let's just focus on the name change for a second. Daniel, his name literally means in Hebrew, God is my judge. Hananiah means the Lord is merciful. Mishael is another derivative of Michael, who is like the Lord. And then Azariah literally means the Lord is my help or helper. And their names are changed. Now think about what this means. Daniel, God is my judge, becomes Belteshazzar. It just means let the God protect the king. Shadrach, who was Hananiah, the Lord is merciful. Shadrach becomes at the command of Aku, the moon god. Meshach becomes, rather than Mishael, who is like God, he becomes Meshach, who is like Aku, the moon god. And then finally, Abednego, who was Azariah, the Lord is my help. He becomes the servant of of Nebo. That's what their names mean. Now you understand what this means. This is the Babylonians rubbing in the face of these people the victory that they had just won over their nation. To the Babylonians, this wasn't just a victory over the Jews. It was a victory of, over the Jews' God. But here's the crazy thing. We'll again unpack this as we work through too. Mentally, emotionally, and relationally, they, the Babylonians were trying to break the faith of these people trusting in their God. They were saying, we won. Your God cannot rescue. There is nothing that he can do. Now you belong to us and all of his vessels belong in the house of our God too. But as you read through the rest of the story, if you were to count the number of times that those names are used, both the Hebrew names and the Babylonian names, this is what you'd find. The name Daniel occurs 75 times. Belteshazzar only occurs eight. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those Babylonian names, they actually occur more than the Hebrew names. But the strange thing is this, and Nathaniel will start unpacking more of this next week when he preaches. But when, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the furnace in chapter 3, what ends up happening in the end is you still see that God is in control. This is what King Nebuchadnezzar says to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At the end, after all that he's seen, he says, I make this decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid to ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. All throughout the story, we're going to see that God is still in control. So to step towards faithful presence, in moments of pressure, we have to remember that God is in control. But I wonder if oftentimes we're functional deists. Do we actually live life as if God is up there, he made some promises, but his hands are off the wheel? Is it up to us in everything from here on out? The text reminds us that even in Babylon, even in exile, God is in control. You can still grow potatoes on Mars. You can still learn to thrive even when you're far from home because God is in control. And specifically, how do we recognize this? I think it happens through prayer. I think it happens through listening to God's promises and reminding one another of those things. I think there's a reason why Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are always spoken of together. Community was important. They needed to remind one another that God was in control. So that's the first thing. Second, despite all offerings, we need to trust God's provision. Let's talk about the food for just a second here. Daniel is not a vegan. That's not what the text is actually describing when he says, just let us eat vegetables and drink water. That's not the point. There is probably something to do with the food being sacrificed to idols, and he doesn't want to defile himself with it that way. We don't ultimately know, but Daniel drops a really big breadcrumb in verse 5. The text says that the king gave to them a daily portion. Now, stop right there and ask yourself this question. At what point in Jewish history was an emphasis made about a daily portion given to God's people? Just think about that for a second. Hopefully, the story of God providing manna for his people is coming to mind. Literally, the Hebrew phrase that is used here in verse 5 is the exact same phrase that's used in Exodus 16, 4, when God provides manna. And did you know there are a number of Hebrew words that can be used to describe giving or providing a daily portion? And the word used here sounds exactly like, it's not the same word, but it sounds like the word manna. I think that's intentional. What Daniel, I think, is trying to do is he's, he's reminding us and he's reminding himself that his daily portion ultimately comes from God. But here's the even more crazy thing about the Hebrew. The word for portion, both in Exodus 16, 4 and here in Daniel 1, 5, the word portion can also be translated word. In many instances, it actually is translated word, like word of God. I think that what Daniel is trying to do is he's dropping these breadcrumbs, is he's trying to demonstrate the fact that he does not live from the bread that flows from the table of the king. He lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I think that's what Daniel is trying to, to show. It's an act of faith by Daniel. I don't want my Babylonian training or provisions, and I don't want the Babylonians, I don't want them to think that what they're giving me is the thing that is sustaining me. I'm going to live by faith, and therefore, I'm only going to eat vegetables and drink water because my daily portion comes from God. He will have to provide. He will have to sustain. Now, the space between day one and day 10, what do you think Daniel and his friends were doing? They didn't want to defile themselves, right? They had 10 days worth of testing set before them. I got, I've got a feeling that they were involved in a ton of prayer. Lord, would you please, please, as I want to remain faithful to you, would you make me strong through what I'm eating? Would you sustain me? So despite all the offerings, are we trusting in God's provision? Think about this. What goods is this empire that we live in today, what goods is it trying to get us to consume? That's a realistic question for us to ask. But also, how are you feasting on God's provision? What are the, the goods that the empire is trying to get us to consume? How about tons of substitute forms of hope? How about trying to find our significance, our security, and our satisfaction 
in things that this world would be able to provide? What about the distraction from the feeling of hopelessness that we sometimes have? What about offering the hope of just another mere human coming to set everything right? What about the idea of being able to create our own meaning or create our own identities over and over and over again? What about trying to find our enoughness through countless things like the right way of parenting or having the latest gadget or having the right job or enough money? On and on and on the list goes. Those things are substitutes for what God is ultimately trying to provide for us as, as his people. On Thursday night during small group, we were doing an icebreaker. And at the very beginning, when we were just spending some time getting to know one another, one of the guys in the group said, okay, the icebreaker for tonight is if you could pick your favorite breakfast, what would it be? And we all kind of went through the list. And one of the people actually said they'd start with an omelet. It'd be like a five course breakfast. They'd start with an omelet. You know, they'd, they'd have some home fries on the side, bacon and sausage, of course, uh, kind of as your meat course, right? And then continued listing things. And then at the end, he said he'd finish up with some pumpkin pie. I love it. I love it. That sounds so good. But imagine eating something like that one time during the week and then never eating anything again for that week. Just one time a week, you feast as, as heavily as you can, and then nothing in a regular rhythm. You know what we're going to see throughout Daniel? He has a regular rhythm of feasting upon God through prayer. We'll see that in Daniel chapter 6. But why, if we don't do that physically, we just eat one meal and think it'll tide us over for the week, why would we think that that would work for us? Are we listening to God day by day? What is your rhythm to feast upon God's provision? Because daily he's trying to provide his word. But in verses 8 through 16, we see Daniel's faithful presence in action. Did you notice in this interaction with the steward, Daniel, he comes and the steward says, I'm afraid that Nebuchadnezzar is going to kill me. And you're going to see Nebuchadnezzar has some, a really hot temper evidently. Constantly, he's just killing people all over and over and over again. And the steward is afraid that if Daniel and his three friends don't look as good as the other youths, that this steward is going to pay for it with his life. But notice what Daniel does not say. He doesn't say, you know what? That's not my problem. I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to compromise. He doesn't say that. But on the other hand, Daniel doesn't say, I don't want you to die, so I will compromise. Daniel says neither of those things. He asks for a trial period in which God had to come through. And Daniel had to learn to live in the midst of that. Now, Nathaniel mentioned something earlier when he introduced the theme of faithful presence. And I know this is something he showed the youth, but it was something that he and I were talking about this last week that Nathaniel's come up with. And imagine two continuum, two lines of continuum. And a lot of times these, these things at opposite ends, we think about on one of them, there's the idea of faithfulness at one end and compromise on the other. And we think that those two things are, are our only options. And oftentimes they are. But then there's a second line here. And on it, at one end, we have isolation. And on the other end, we have the idea of presence actually being in the community in which we live. But we think if we're going to be faithful, we have to isolate. You know what? I'm going to not defile myself, so if you die, not my problem. But on the other hand, if we compromise, okay, I'll eat the food from the king's table. That'll make me present. But Daniel does neither of those things, right? The reality is that somehow we have to figure out a way as God's people to be faithfully present. And that's what Daniel does. Daniel asks for time and he asks that God would give him what he needs. The truth is you can, we can be in the world, but not of it. Faithfulness can grow here. I know it feels like growing potatoes on Mars, but it evidently is possible. God gave Daniel favor. Three times in this text, God gives something. He gave Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. God is in control despite appearances, but God is also providing for his people constantly. And God gives favor. But did you know that though that word is not the word favor? 
It's the word hesed. God gave steadfast love and compassion to Daniel. Those two words used in sequence or in combination always take us back to Exodus 34 in the name of God. God was present with his people. So are we asking God for this? And are we trusting that God will provide? In the New Testament, the scriptures tell us that the people of God have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us as a down payment guaranteeing what is to come. This text talks a lot about wisdom, which is where we're gonna go in just a second as we conclude. But the New Testament tells us that we have a wisdom, a spiritual wisdom, says 1 Corinthians chapter two. Paul even says, believe it or not, we're given the mind of Christ. Are we leaning into that? Are we asking God to apply that reality for us? What would it look like for you to trust in God's provision? Are you asking him for wisdom in your home, in your job, for reconciliation, for racial justice to be made manifest in your life, in my life, in our communities? This is a daily thing, church. There's no divine download that you just get to walk away from and everything's good from that point on. Despite all offerings and the world is gonna offer us plenty, we have to see and trust in God's provision. We can flourish in exile. Faithfulness can grow here. But if that's true, we have to see that God is in control. We have to trust God's provision. And finally, despite all rivals, we have to seek God's wisdom. This is the last breadcrumb. Those words, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, learning, they're used in verse 4, verse 17, and verse 20. And did you notice that Nebuchadnezzar wants these men trained in the ways of Babylon, the wisdom of Babylon, the literature, the language? He wants them to literally feast upon the wisdom of Babylon. And at the end of the passage, Nebuchadnezzar brings these four Jewish men before him, these boys actually before him. And it, it seems like at the end, Nebuchadnezzar is looking for other options, right? He brings these people in and it says that no one was found as wise, but it says that Nebuchadnezzar was looking among the magicians and the enchanters. He's looking for a, a rival kind of wisdom. Please tell me that there's some wisdom out there that is better than this wisdom. There's got to be another option. We all live our lives that way, don't we? Pause and think about the fact that we all consider rival forms of wisdom. This has been the reality since the beginning. Genesis 3. The first couple looked at the tree and they thought that the fruit could make them wise. It was beautiful in their own eyes. That phrase gets played out throughout the Old Testament. One of the places in is, is in Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5 verses 20 and 21 say, Woe to the one who is wise in their own eyes. Woe to the one who calls evil good and good evil. Woe to the one who calls dark light and light dark. We're all looking for rival forms of wisdom. But let's just be honest for a second. Like who really did live the best life? Who lived with justice? Who lived with kindness? There's only one answer. Jesus did that, and yet constantly we're looking for other people to lead us. And yet Jesus says in Matthew 7 at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the one who hears my words and puts them into practice, that person's like a wise person who builds their house upon a rock. These words, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, learning, one of the places that you see this most frequently is in Proverbs 3. Look at this. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not my steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you, but bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Do you see those verses being fulfilled here in Daniel? He is a blessing. 
as he's not leaning on his own understanding, God is making straight his path, and he, in the end, finds favor and good success in the sight of God and man. He thrives. He's like that tree. He's like potatoes grown on Mars. God is willing to do this. We need it. We need God's wisdom, not our own, not the world's. We need God's wisdom. Daniel needs it. Story after story, we are going to see Daniel up against it all the time. He has to figure out how to flourish in exile. So how do we live? How do we live in this culture? The Christian tendency church is to do one of three things, none of which is right. In this culture, sometimes we withdraw, we cloister, we hide. That's the wrong response. The other option is that we try to seek power so that in the end we can coerce other people into doing what we want them to do. That's not the way of Jesus or the way of wisdom either. The other option that some churches and people choose is to compromise. That's not the right option either. We have to figure out how to flourish in exile. How can we be faithfully present? What does that mean? For today, let's start with this. It means that we, in essence, do two things. We learn how to identify what the world is seeking, what it's looking for. We listen well for what people are looking for, and then we connect with those things. We listen, or we identify, and we connect because we probably want those very same things. And some of those things that they want, like justice, those are good things. They're biblical things. We identify and we connect. But then the second thing that we do, and it's a pair as well, we subvert and we offer. In subversion, we ask good questions. How is it that what the world is offering is actually going to fail you ultimately? It's not going to end where you want it to end. And then we offer them the truth of the gospel. That's what we're going to see in Daniel over and over and over again. That's what it means to be faithfully present. We learn the narratives of our culture and we connect with those. But then in the end, we subvert those and we offer them the truth and the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Martin Lloyd-Jones once wrote this. He says the New Testament is never interested in conduct or behavior itself. I can go further and say that the New Testament does not make an appeal for good behavior to anyone but Christian people. The New Testament is not interested as such in the morality of the world. It tells us quite plainly that you can expect nothing from the world but sin and that in its fallen condition, it is incapable of anything else. He continues, in Titus 3.3, Paul tells us that we were all once like that. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Thus, there is nothing according to the New Testament, that is so foolish and futile as to turn to such people and try to make them live a Christian life. We cannot try to coerce other people into living a Christian or moral life. The truth, Martin Lloyd-Jones concludes, is that for followers of Jesus, we have one message for people in the world, and it is this. It is a message of a gracious God calling them to repentance. We have to learn to be faithfully present. We have to learn how to grow potatoes on Mars. At the end of the movie, The Martian, Mark Watney is teaching other astronauts and he says this. He says, I guarantee you that at some point everything is going to go south on you. You're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Now, you can either accept that or you can get to work. The bottom line is that we can flourish in exile. But if we're going to do that, if faithfulness is going to grow here, we have to remember that God is in control. We have to trust that God is providing 
and we have to seek after his wisdom. Lord Jesus, that is our earnest prayer today, that you would come, that you would help us to see you for who you are, reminding us that you, O oh God, are sovereign and in control. Teach us, O oh God, how to be faithfully present. Teach us, O oh God, how to feast upon what you provide for us day by day, and teach us to seek after the wisdom that only comes from you. O oh God, we need you. We need this, O oh Father. And so just like Daniel, we call upon you to provide. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you respond, uh, I would invite you to just uh, imagine or even ask God what it would look like on a regular daily basis to come before him humbly and to say, Lord, I, I give you today. Uh, I entrust this day to you. Um, and then to speak out truth of what it is you believe about the day or what it is that you believe about what you're afraid of or what you want, uh, what the world wants, and then just receive um, what God has for you. So as we sing this last song, uh, it's a classic hymn. Uh, just be mindful and think about all the ways that uh, Christ is for us and he is alive in us. Let's sing.
thanks again for joining us today for our time of worship. Pray that over the course of this next week, you will be seeking after God, finding ways to live faithfully present, uh, even in the midst of the pressures that are always around us. And now as God's people receive this blessing, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of His Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.